Hey, welcome back everybody. So, it is a lot harder than I thought it would be to pick movies that I want to review at the beginning of starting this channel. Like, it's infancy like it is right now. And I thought it would be a lot easier for some reason. Like, I will think of a few movies and say, alright, I want to do this, I want to do this, and this. And then just another one will pop in my head and then another one and another one and then before i know it i have 10 films in my head and three of them don't get done and then two others don't and three do and it definitely is a lot harder than i would thought of it would have been but we have one of my guilty pleasure movies it's very divisive the director is very divisive in the horror community but we are talking Rob Zombie's first film, House of a Thousand Corpses, starring, of course, Sid Haig, Sherry Moon Zombie, Bill Mosley, uh, Karen Black, who, uh, all horror icons except for Sherry Moon, but Rain Wilson, who uh, I'll always think of as Dwight from The Office, no matter what, and Chris Hardwick, who plays the asshole Jerry. Um, Zombie's music. I'll start with like how I feel about Rob Zombie. I like Rob Zombie's early music. I've always liked White Zombie's albums. I like uh, Zombie's first like few solo albums, Hellbilly Deluxe and uh, Sinister Urge. After that, like I really kind of fell off him and stuff. I really don't care for his music after that. But I ended up hearing before this came out and stuff that Zombie was going to be directing a horror film and. I was immediately interested and excited about that and was just thinking of the possibilities. It's like if you would have heard back in the day that Alice Cooper was going to be making a horror film. Same type of deal. Like they have horror integrated into their music and everything so much that just the possibilities for a film by them is like sky's the limit. So um, hearing that, I was excited as hell to see this movie when it finally would release. And almost instantly forgot all about it. <laughs> totally forgot about this movie coming out when it did. And came out in 2003, I believe. I didn't see it until college, so like two years later. And a lot of my love for this movie comes from my first viewing experiences with it. So there's definitely a lot of nostalgia attached to this film for me. So it's going to be very biased in that way. But the first time I saw this movie, I was in college. I was by like three, four, five friends of mine. We all got together at one of their houses and we threw this movie on. And let's say just not the nowhere near the normal state of mind of normal everyday life. <laughs> Three times in the course of six days, we watched this movie like that and had no idea what was going on in this film for three viewings all within a week, except that we knew that it was just batshit crazy. <laughs> and then we finally watched it again like a week later after that normally and finally like was able to completely and normally digest what was going on in this film and everything but just my first experiences watching this movie is a huge part of how I feel about this movie and where my love for this movie comes from zombie I'm not going to get big into his career as a director in this video. Like, I love, obviously, Devil's Rejects is a great movie. Um, besides that, he's very hit or miss for me. I, I'll get into it in reviews for the movies he's done later that I actually care about. I don't want to talk too much about his career as a director right now. But, um, so we open up with Dr. Wolfenstein's Halloween Marathon, and this movie is just so over the top, and just like, like Zombie was just throwing everything at the wall that he possibly could, and if it stuck, it stuck, if it didn't, fuck it, he's just tried everything with this, and some things work, some things don't, 
most do for me and at this point and after seeing it so many times i can't even say how many times i've seen this movie i know this movie line for line and yet i still have to take a bunch of notes because despite having the memory to remember a ton of movies line for line i know that i would absolutely just lose that great memory and be replaced with a garbage brain and forget things to talk about so we, after the little uh, intro with uh, Doc, Dr. Wolfenstein's Halloween Marathon, we go to Captain Spaulding's commercial, and Cap Sid Haig in this movie is just, his performance by now is just iconic. Same with Bill Mosley as Otis. The whole Firefly, Firefly family is just iconic at this point. Like, and Zombie, say what you will about him, but he really knows how to cast a horror film. And he basically just completely relaunched Bill Mosley and Sid Haig's careers with this film and with Devil's Rejects. Like, you got to give him credit for that because, I mean, we have obviously chopped top from, for, with uh, Bill Mosley in Texas Chainsaw 2, which is an iconic character. But he wasn't in many classic roles or memorable roles after that until this film. And we also have Karen Black, who obviously is a horror icon as well. And it was good that she, he was able to get her also. So we go open up in uh, October 30th in 1977. And we open up with Captain Spaulding's Museum of Monsters and Mad Men. Sideshow, like tourist trap type of uh, location. And that neon sign that says Captain Spaulding's Museum of Monsters and Mad Men with the lights around it and everything. If if I can pick like top three movie props to own, that would be one of them. Just to own that neon sign outside of his little tourist trap place. Love it. Would absolutely kill to have that prop in my possession. Um, <laughs> the dialogue just between Spaulding and the his friend who's in there and stuff, talking about twisting the guy twisting a pencil in his eye and stuff like that, and he doesn't really hurt himself. He just kind of puts it to the side of his eye and twists it, and Spaulding saying he probably puts his, that that pencil somewhere else, and the guy says, "No, nah, he doesn't do anything like that." And then goes on to say, "But what if he had a Planet of the Apes doll stuck up his asshole?" <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't do anything like that, but then immediately says that he had a much more complex and big item up his ass. <laughs> I just thought that's hilarious. Uh, Spaulding his little skeleton thing around his neck that he pulls the, and it lights up and the mouth goes and he's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Awesome stuff. I love that. We have these robbers that come in and God, does this main robber guy overact the shit out of everything that he says in this scene just completely over the top and <laughs> we have the other one the other uh, robber who's with him who is recognized by uh spaulding's little friend that's in the place with him and starts saying i know you you're a little dickwick and they start to say they used to sing the song you little dickwick plays with his prick and <laughs> Just the dialogue is just like this movie say what you will again about zombies later movies and just like the constant redneck characters and just trashy redneck dialogue and stuff yes absolutely is way overused in everything he's done from in his career basically but for this movie and for devil's rejects it just works like for some reason like compared to his later films like the halloween remakes and um 31 which is terrible and it's just it's so overbearing in those films but in this movie and devil's rejects it just works very well and just the robber pointing the gun at Spaulding and saying, you know, counting down three and, and, and fuck your mama and fuck your sister, fuck your grandma. Just amazing. And then after the guy comes in, chops up the robber, he's sitting on the ground, laying on the ground, bleeding out. And then Spaulding is a little line of, and most of all, fuck you, and shoots him three times in the head. Awesome stuff. Such a great opening scene. 
and we get the credit song, which is Zombies House of a Thousand Corpses is the title of the song. And like I said, I love Zombies early music and just a great little song to put the tone and set the tone of this movie. So we have these four kids driving in their car, uh, Bill and his girlfriend, Mary, and is that right? Yeah, Bill and Mary and Denise and Jerry. And why Denise is with this guy, Jerry, I will never know. What an annoying character. Like this, him, Chris Hardwick playing this character in this movie ruined Chris Hardwick for me completely. Like when after years after this movie and seeing this movie, when he started doing Talking Dead after the Walking Dead episodes and stuff, I just could not stand Chris Hardwick because of just how annoying he is in this movie as Jerry. Why she's with him, I will never know. Like, do you, uh, you want to, we're going to go on a murder ride. And I don't want to go on a murder ride. If you do want to go on a murder ride, like, why? Why are you with this guy? He's so fucking obnoxious and annoying and belittling. But he does have some funny lines in this movie, so it's not completely a lost cause. Um, so they're looking through... Uh, the Museum of Monsters and Mad Men and seeing all like this like alligator boy uh, crocodile boy and like monkey man like all the weird sideshow attractions which uh, Bill pointing out saying did you see crocodile boy boy is actually like uh, I really like that it's kind of like a pretty like hidden foreshadowing of what happens to Bill later on and uh <laughs> Again, I put just Jerry is so annoying, everything that he does. So they end up going on this murder ride that Spalding has at his little tourist trap. And they're going through this little haunted cart type ride. And they're talking about Albert Fish and Lizzie Borden, uh, Ed Gein. And they finally, Spalding gets to Dr. Satan and mentions the story about him and how he was a local legend and he was taken out when he was a surgeon, a master surgeon. And they took him out and hung him from a tree not too far from where they are right now. And they end up getting off the ride and we get Jerry's famous line, of, Dr. Satan, Dr. Satan. <laughs> Such a ridiculous line, but it's, it's iconic at this point. Um, I like the shot of the, the kids and everything trick-or-treating um, when Denise calls her father to say that they're going to be late because they stopped at the Spalding's place and it kind of threw their schedule off and everything. It's a nice little shot. I like that. So she says that she, they're going to be late. They stopped at this place called Spalding's so the father knows where they were last, which comes into play later. We get a news report of the five cheerleaders missing from Rugsville, which is a nearby town from where this all takes place. So they're still in uh, Spalding's place, and uh, they're asking about Dr. Satan. Jerry, basically, is asking about, you know, he lives for this shit, and can, uh, like, asking them all different questions and stuff. So he ends up, uh, Spalding ends up drawing a map to this tree that Dr. Satan was uh, um, supposedly hung from and then disappeared from. So it draws him a map and they start driving. It's raining like crazy out and they just come upon baby Firefly, played by Sherry Moon Zombie, obviously. And say what you will about her acting. She's not a great actress, but Again, with so much nostalgia I have for this film and with how iconic the Firefly family characters have become since this movie and Devil's Rejects and in the years since that until today, it's still an iconic character. Like, I love Baby. I think she's such a great twisted character. Her little cackle, which I will not do and impersonate right now, but just her little cackle laugh that she does is so irritating, but it's so just like babyish, you know, it serves her name well and just very, very cool stuff. So they blow their tire out 
And we get this funny line from Jerry uh, and Bill, this little exchange of dialogue that Bill says, uh, Jerry, did you fill up the spare like I asked you to? And he says, yes, of course. And he said, uh, what would happen if I forgot to put the spare back in the trunk? What would plan B be? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, Jesus Christ, Jerry, I did what you said, technically, and <laughs> he did. A funny little exchange right there. Um, baby's behavior, just in the car, just like, oh, I love this song, and turns the music up, and it is just like crazy rock music, and she's just like dancing in the car, and who does this? Like, <laughs> in some, you're a hitchhiker in somebody's car that they were nice enough to come pick you up at a rain. And you're just like, touching their radio and like, just taking control over the whole car. It's completely ridiculous. Uh, so Bill ends up walking with Baby to Baby's house. And Baby says that her brother can send a tow truck. And he has a tow truck and that he can bring it and repair the car for them. So they walk to the house and we meet Otis Driftwood, played by Bill Mosley. And... There are very few, it's very interesting, actually, when I think about this, there are very few actors that can play a, a play a character that becomes an iconic character, that you can only look at them as that character, like him as Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw 2. It's so rare for an actor to then go on years later and play a different role that becomes even more iconic and that's what he's seen as from then on i can't think of many other actors that have done that with roles i can only think of at this moment like brian cranston not in horror obviously but when i was growing up malcolm in the middle was on and stuff anytime i saw brian cranston he was, well, he was Tim Watley and Seinfeld and the dentist, but he was always Hal to me from Malcolm in the Middle. And anytime I saw him, that's who he was. He was Hal, the father from Malcolm in the Middle, the goofy father. And then, obviously, he went on to do Breaking Bad, and now you cannot look at Brian Cranston without seeing Walter White. It's such a rare occurrence that an actor can do that, go from just one character they're known for an iconic character and then later on in the career just completely do a, another character and become even more famous and just related and always just linked to that character i always thought that was very interesting so we meet otis and he's just his character is just so hard to even describe he's like he sounds like a rambling conspiracy nut like everything that comes out of his mouth just sounds like talking in circles and just like riddles and nonsensical shit that only just like an insane person would even attempt to try to understand like he just he sounds like a flat earther who just like with crazy conspiracies and thoughts and like people are the government runs everything and sheep everybody are sheep and stuff like that like that type of personality except more psychotic and murderous and just insanely depraved obviously and uh, there's some cool lighting in um this movie like on otis like with the red lighting on his face and everything i like that very nice shots um baby and bill get to the house and Bill <laughs> notices and Baby points out all of her dolls that are basically pinned to the wall outside the house. And there are a shit ton of dolls pinned up to this house. And she makes a comment that, like, these are all my dolls. I used to, like, when I was young, I used to cut their arms and legs off and stick them right on the walls. <laughs> uh, this is the time to, like, you know, turn around and run, right? no all right so they <laughs> they end up um getting the shit scared out of them the rest of the the other three that were left behind with the car and um when rj the brother ends up coming with the tow truck the girls scream bloody murder because he's wearing this like fox hat and stuff and just completely scares the hell out of him and jerry's like it's just the tow truck guy i don't know how he didn't freak out too though because 
anybody would in that situation. It's in the pouring rain with a guy with a fox hat just standing there, like creepily in front of the car. Anyone would freak out with that. And we're back with Baby and Bill in the house and asked do you live alone and he's like i think otis is messing around upstairs somewhere and we cut to otis just like gagging one of the cheerleaders torturing her just like such craziness um and we have this throughout the whole movie there's just these crazy random scenes that are just cut into like the movie like with we have baby like uh talking and like rolling around naked with skeletons and stuff like that and then like just right back to the the actual film like we get a lot of random scenes like that which you know some people think are overindulgent and in a way it is and it's pretentious but i don't care i love this movie so much and i love everything about this movie and does baby want to fuck bill like i don't know like she's legitimately flirting with him and then when he says like oh they're back and stuff with the with the tow truck she uh says like oh what did he fucking do like she seems like genuinely like upset like that she was turned down kind of so does she want to fuck bill i don't know possibly we meet Karen Black's character as Mother Firefly, and by God, does she overact like a motherfucker in this movie. But again, still iconic character. Don't care. She can overact all she wants. She's fucking Karen Black. So <laughs> she can do whatever she wants in this movie. Again, again, I wrote, Jerry is such a dick. He really is. <laughs> Karen Black sits down, and Jerry immediately just looks down her shirt and stuff with his girlfriend right there. Again, why is Denise with this guy? I will never know. And <laughs> she asks him, and he's just, and all his lines, he just starts fucking with Karen Black, with Mother Firefly, and uh, I'm Qualsnard of the Crag ne Nebula, and <laughs> what are you guys doing out here? And so I thought we'd be taking a hoe down, and <laughs> just fucking ridiculous lines, and she takes offense to that, and well, you know that this is just how he is all the time, because you know, the friends they all like apologize for him and the way he's acting and stuff like that, so they deal with him like this on a daily basis, which again, my point, why do they hang out with this guy, why are they friends with this person, why is this woman dating this guy, I don't know. And they end up saying that it's going to take a couple hours to fix the car because they have to go get a new wheel. And Mary just freaks out and saying, a couple hours? Like, are you kidding me? Like, they're stuck here. And we meet Tiny, who is played by Matthew McCory, who sadly passed away after Devil's Rejects. I think, like, real soon after they filmed Devil's Rejects or, like, right during the end of filming or something like that. But uh, plays the giant burn victim, Tiny, which, Tiny, come on, I mean, yeah, cute little pun, but come on, you kind of came up with a better name than that. Um, again, you meet this big-ass thing called Tiny, and again, time to get the fuck out of there, right? No? All right, carry on. So the Karen Black starts explaining um, that Earl, her husband, uh, wasn't a bad man and never hit her or anything. But one day went devil on them and tried burning the house down, but never meant to harm them. He wasn't a bad man, never hit you or nothing, but he tried burning your house down what <laughs> like he wasn't a bad man like it was such a weird line <laughs> like, like come on never hit her but tried burning the entire house down with your family inside of it and this is how tiny is badly burned and why he has to wear a mask and they start talking about it, saying uh Karen Black is saying how he'll warm up to them eventually and take his mask off and uh, especially the girls, because he's a real lady killer. Again, at this point, run, right? No? All right, carry on. 
we hear the Ramones playing and we have the scene with Baby with the cheerleader screaming like, give me a B, give me an A, give me a B, give me a Y, what's that spell? And just so many iconic lines in this movie. I love this movie. Death, I can't say it enough. And we get the shot after that of just like the other cheerleader, just gray and dead, just tied up to the bed. Great stuff. So they have to put on masks at the dinner table. And it, I like how when they say put your masks on, it cuts right to a shot of Tiny, who's already wearing his mask. I don't know if that was intended, but. I noticed it on this last rewatch, actually, so I had to mention it. I don't know if that was intended. It could have been, because as soon as they say you have to put your masks on, it shoots right to Tiny, who has his mask on already. I thought that was cute, like, if that was intended. So Jerry starts asking about Dr. Satan, if they know anything about it, and Otis makes his entrance with a jar containing a fetus of Mother Firefly's, like, aborted child. Again, for like the fourth or fifth time now, time to get the fuck out of there, right? Apparently no again? All right, carry on. <laughs> Love Otis's look in this movie. Compared to Devil's Rejects, I vastly prefer him in this movie, the way he looks. Like, the albino look with the, like, red eyes and his white hair and everything. Like, love his look in this. I, I get why they changed it in Devil's Rejects to make him look more normal. Uh, because it's just more of a less over-the-top and more down-to-earth, gritty, like kind of spaghetti western-y on the road type of movie so i can see why they changed otis's look but i vastly prefer how he looks in this movie um then we have showtime that the grandpa yugo announces and this is just such an insane scene we have the grandpa telling jokes just insanely perverse jokes like check your wife's pussy and he screams and he's like ah and the whole look like stops himself and stuff just it's so weird and crazy and then we get baby doing her song and dance act and they have chairs set up like with like dummies and stuff that are like the audience as well as the four you know young adult characters that we have here and we have mary gets furious when baby sits on bill's lap and just gets up and says get the fuck off him you whore and pushes her to the ground and just says and she baby pulls a knife right out and says what if i'll cut your fucking tits off and stick them down your throat just craziness and right there at that moment RJ comes in says the car is done and Karen like I think you should leave and they get out of there immediately get in the car and they try to leave and escape this place which unfortunately obviously does not happen I've heard this discussed a lot I've thought about this a lot I've seen it talked about everywhere. Would they have let them go? If they didn't insult Baby, if Mary didn't call her a prostitute and push her to the ground and stuff like that, would they have let these kids go? I don't know. Possibly. I go back and forth on this because obviously I lean more towards there's no fucking way they were letting these people go. Like, this is what they do. They're just cold-blooded killers, and it's all a game to them, and they would never have any intention of letting them go. But RJ fixes the car for them. Why? Like, why would you fix their car if you had no intention of letting them leave? That was always weird. Unless he fixed the car just because he had to move the car afterwards and get rid of it. I guess I just you know, answered my own question. That might be what it is, just so they can get rid of the car and, you know, get rid of the evidence that they took these four people hostage and, you know, eventually kills them. But, um, yeah, I don't think that they ever had an intention of letting them go. And we get the car ambush scene, and 
how did Otis and Tiny know that they were going to be leaving at that exact moment? Like, they weren't in the Showtime scene stuff. They had no idea that Mary pushed Baby and that they left at that exact moment. So how long were Tiny and Otis dressed up as scarecrows just waiting there in the rain for them to leave? What if Mary didn't freak out? What if Showtime went on for another four and a half hours? Like, would they have been waiting out there in the Scarecrow outfits for hours, waiting for them to leave? I thought that was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but, again, it's such a great scene, though, with them just manhandling the guys and just the girls in the backseat screaming and then seeing Otis take the, the mask off and Tiny, you know, capturing the girls and everything, Otis jumping on the car awesome stuff um then we cut the halloween day and uh the father of denise who she called earlier and mentioned that they you know were going to be late calls a, a friend of his from city hall and says that the the kids were supposed to show up by now you know and they never showed up so he says he'll check it out he knows about spaulding's place and we get Mary and Otis's scene with, again, just Otis just rambling about just insane stuff that makes no sense. Just, uh, you work. Have you ever worked? I'm sure you have scooping ice cream your friends on summer break. And stuff. <laughs> and, like, this is an old Mickey Mouse socks on one foot and Minnie Mouse on the other or something like that. Just complete insanity. Like, no sense at all to anything that he says except to him and maybe his family but i don't even think i don't even think the rest of the firefly family know what the fox otis is talking about 99 percent of the time and we get the just iconic scene of fish boy and we see a clip of of otis and baby to the song brick house throwing knives at bill's character that he's pinned to like this target and then otis takes an axe and cuts his hand off and sticks it in his face and cool stuff and then mary asks where he is and she is horrified when mosley otis ends up revealing bill and goes fish boy and she just this can't be real this can't be real and we just zoom in on the whole body of bill fused with a fish and everything such a great shot like such a great idea and just the way it's executed i love that scene so much um the score in this movie i i believe zombie like co-wrote the score and I love the score in this movie. Just like the ding ding synthesizers and stuff, and then uh, just all of this, the whole score in this movie is just so effective and very well done. Um, then we meet uh, Sergeant Wydell and Nash, and they go to interrogate Spaulding about the missing kids and have a picture of Denise and are showing, uh, asking if they if he's seen them which he says he has and has his little line about <laughs> not his type and he likes them more with meat on their bones because sweeter the pushing <laughs> just insane lines from Spaulding and it's Sid Haig's performance is just so amazing in this movie and in Devil's Rejects same with Otis with uh, Bill Mosley's performance just absolutely incredible stuff and just absolutely iconic at this point and I love his line of, uh, you know, after they were asking uh, questions about Dr. Satan and stuff, uh, the cops asked, you know, what, did, uh, what else? And he said, nothing. Stupid-ass kids probably got themselves turned around as backwards and got themselves lost. <laughs> and he scratches his head like he's an ape, like, hmm, I don't know. And, like, they, they're not having it at all. Like, they end up just like, all right, write those same damn directions out for me. And it's just like, don't get all true great on my ass. And just awesome dialogue between them. Just, I, I love everything about this movie. I'm going to keep saying that because I don't care. This is one of my favorite movies, probably. Like, at least from, like, the 2000s onward. Such a great film. And 
we end up getting another random scene with this skunk ape and this couple saying that and like the the way that it's shot like with the inverted colors and everything like that really cool how it looks but insane scene it's the woman saying that this skunk ape performed lurid acts on me and my person and just <laughs> crazy stuff and we have Mer um, Denise wakes up after having this dream that has a gravestone that says memory of Dr. Satan. And then Arm reaches up, Carrie style, and wakes her up. And she wakes up tied to the bed in the room with Tiny, and she's pleading with him to let her to let her go and release her. And I love Tiny's shirt and says cheap ass Halloween costume. So funny. <laughs> That's such a great t-shirt. And Tiny just doesn't seem to care at all, like, whether what happens to these people or not. So he just lets her go. He just, all right, let me go, okay. He just, just takes the straps off of her, and she's thanking him and stuff, and he just, like, waves to her. He's like, you know you're not getting out of here, so whatever. The way that Tiny slurps his food, it always just makes me almost sick to my stomach like it's such a disgusting sound and they throw Otis comes down and throws Denise into this cage where just these bodies jump on her and this is where things just start losing reality completely and you have to suspend all disbelief because this is just it just gets crazy and over the top and so unrealistic and it's just it's just still amazing though it really is and we have the cops end up finding the kid's car and they find the uh, cheerleaders, one of the cheerleaders' bodies tied up in the back of the car in the trunk. And I love the uh, one of the guy's lines to uh, Nash. When Nash says, I found something, the keys. And he's like, well, don't just stand out there like some prize dog dick get help in the trunk. <laughs> Great line. And like I said, they find his body. Uh, the body of the cheerleader. We get a scene with Baby and Jerry, and she's cutting his hair and rubbing it in his face. He's saying, you can't keep us here, and blah, blah, blah. And she ends up playing a game with him and saying, you know, who's my favorite actress or actor? And uh, says, if you get it right, I'll let you go. And he guesses Marilyn Monroe, which is kind of funny because I just did a review on Fade to Black, which is all about Marilyn Monroe and lookalike and everything. And he's wrong, unfortunately. It's Betty Davis. And she just goes, sorry, you lose. And cackles while she scalps Jerry. So crazy. And we see Otis throwing nonchalantly just sitting there with grandpa Hugo just throwing knives at Jerry like missing him just like target practice around his body I like Otis and Hugo's little dynamic about um just the way that like don't start with me Hugo and like even the grandpa is just like fuck you and stuff like you could tell that they hate they really don't like each other uh Nash makes a uh, says a line that he hopes uh, Denise's father, who was an ex -cop, he's an ex-cop, and he's brought on to help Wydell and Nash investigate what happened to you know, Denise and the friends, his daughter and her friends. And he has this line where he says, I just hope he doesn't get in my way. Like a tough cop like this. Only a few minutes later, to freak out like a pussy, from a dog when they're searching the house of the fireflies <laughs> and he's going on like and uh, the father is just like calm down it's just a dog and Nash is like oh I was bitten by a cocker spaniel when I was eight years old he's like it almost took my pinky toe off <laughs> It's so ridiculous, so funny, and we have another random scene of just this African American man who is just saying like, I says his name, I know the truth, and he's like, this is hell, this is hell, this is hell, awesome stuff, so random, but we get to the scene when they the cops arrive at the house of the fireflies and Wydell knocks on the door and Karen Black answers Otis uh, is told that cops are at the door and he has, says he'll go take control like he always fucking does and we get my favorite scene in this movie and when I first saw this scene 
this is the scene that made me say to myself, Zombie actually has amazing potential as a director. And that is obviously the scene with Slim Whitman's I Remember You playing as the cops and uh, Denise's father opened the barn and Mary's tied up in there and all the bodies of the cheerleaders are all over the place and Whitell's showing pictures to Karen Black's character and she shoots him in the side of the head and then Otis comes out and shoots the father and with all just Slim Whitman's yodeling going on this amazing scene absolutely brilliant like I cannot say enough about this scene just one of my favorite scenes in a horror film probably ever it is so good and just the way it ends with just this the slow just like tension building of Otis holding the gun to Nash's head for way too long until you're just like come on already just shoot this guy and then when he finally does and the birds fly off it's an absolutely brilliant scene amazing then we get the pussy liquor red hot pussy liquor scene when they and baby and rj go to pick up liquor and uh we meet <laughs> and make fun of goober jerry ober and we get her classic line of, we like to get fucked up and do fucked up shit such a great line Otis ends up skinning the father, which we see the aftermath of. We see, like, his corpse and stuff with the face removed and stuff. Great shot. Like, cool-looking effects. And (laughs) Otis ends up coming down the stairs wearing the father's face over his face. And the whole family is chanting, Otis, Otis. And the remaining three uh, characters are dressed up in rabbit suits and tied up to a pole and Otis comes down with the the, man, the face of the father over it and he's touching uh, Denise and saying get daddy some sugar and stuff like that and she, they're coming to and stuff and freaks out when she realizes it's not her father it's his face <laughs> over Otis's face and just absolutely terrifying can you imagine being in that situation that absolutely insane and he starts going around talking to all three of them gets to jerry and says and you like you what is it you want to know oh dr satan i'll make you meet the little bastard and we get just the classic line of it's all true the boogeyman is real and you found him and it echoes afterwards and switches to the shot of outside at nighttime with them walking with the boom Boom. Awesome. Such great stuff. Shout out to Heather for bringing that line up the other night. Thank you, because it is one of my favorite lines in this movie. And so we have them walking the you know, two, uh, the three remaining uh, kids over to this well that they're going to lower them down in a coffin in. And Mary runs off, and we get my second favorite scene in this movie and it's the run rabbit run scene with otis and just the way he delivers his lines in this scene just like hunting humans ain't nothing but nothing they all run like scary little rabbits and the run rabbit run and the music with the, like the choir like ha 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 just so fucking good and the last two lines of him screaming run rabbit run like amazing such a great scene i've always wondered this baby chases mary when she runs off and you hear her singing a song as she's chasing Mary. Mary doesn't know where she is. And she's saying that once was a girl who lived in the cabbage garden. Sorry, I had to pause that for a second. I'm actually going upstate um, very shortly. So uh, I gotta finish this up because this is going for way too long. But um, Mary runs away from uh, Baby and uh, she's hearing her sing the song and she's saying, Mary, I'm gonna get you and it's echoing and stuff. At first I thought it was a stylistic choice, but when I watch it over and over again, 
she holds her ears, Mary, like she can't take it anymore. Like she can't take hearing the echoing and the sound and stuff. It makes me think that they drugged them with LSD or some type of hallucinogen or crazy drug. Because she reacts like she's hearing these hallucinations, like these echoes and stuff. And can you imagine, like that makes this a million times more traumatizing. Being drugged up on acid back in the late 70s and being murdered and seeing all this crazy shit that they've seen, I could not imagine. And um, we end up having Mary get stabbed by baby with her saying her shoe shoe says the maiden. They're just great lines. Then we have Denise and Jerry that get lowered into this well that brings them down underground. And they're in a coffin. And then they have the chanting music they lower down. Absolutely terrifying. I can imagine just being in that situation. And... We see when uh, they break, these zombies come out, and again, this is just over the top, just nonsensical stuff. And they're supposedly Dr. Satan's experiments that are down there for who knows how long. And basically, we see this rabbit dressed old man. And it always made me wonder how long have they been doing this? Like, they only go after what we see in this movie, like the, the cheerleaders and the four main characters who are young adults. And we see this old man in the rabbit suit. And I've always wondered, has he been down there for so long that he aged into an old man? I mean, realistically, obviously, it makes no sense at all. But nothing does in this movie. So it's possible, and I think that's terrifying <laughs> if that's actually what happened. So we get the shot of the hallway with the skeletons all over the place as it zooms down the hallway. Awesome shot. And then we finally see Dr. Satan, and his design is so awesome. It's just his arms are propped up with like wires, and he's got a respirator on, and he's speaking the foreign language great stuff he's got jerry on the table and he's cutting into his head and doing surgery on him we have earl which is the husband apparently of firefly mother firefly chases uh denise throughout the, the tunnels and everything like that and we see a nice shot of back above ground with otis burning the bodies and just the fire spreading everywhere really cool shot we get another cool shot where Denise just with the camera on her one eye looking back and forth up close with uh, the uh, mutant Earl coming up behind her and he tries hitting her with an axe. He breaks like the wood planks and everything comes tumbling down and Denise ends up climbing out of the ground. It's daylight out and she ends up she's all bloody she gets to the road and captain spaulding picks her up and says she says i gotta get to a doctor he said don't worry people have been looking for you girl uh we'll get you to the doctor and otis comes out of that is in the back seat and she doesn't get away she wakes up on dr satan's table and she's just turned into another experiment or killed she doesn't get away and we just get the end with a question mark, credits with the cover of Brick House. This went on for way too long. I have to get on the road to go upstate. I will have other reviews coming up by the weekend. I'm, gonna, I'm going upstate to see my daughter and I have notes taken for a few movies already. So I will have more reviews up. Thank you guys for tuning in and I will see you guys soon.